Welcome to Tech Central. Welcome to our studio. Welcome to TC Daily, South Africa's new daily technology show. My name is Duncan McLeod. If you've missed any of the episodes we have released so far, do go to youtube.com slash techcentral. You'll find them all there. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon and you won't miss any episodes. Of course, you can also get them from Tech Central itself. That's techcentral.co.za. Subscribe to our daily newsletter. You will get that at 5 a.m. every day with all the latest episodes of TC Daily and all the latest South African and international tech news. We've got a very exciting guest in the studio now. I'm very pleased to welcome Jan Pilbauer. He is the CEO of an institution called BankServe Africa. Jan, um, many South Africans probably haven't, haven't even heard of Bank Serve Africa, but you play a fundamentally important role in South Africa's financial ecosystem. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Tell us a bit about Bank Serve Africa and what it is you guys do. Yeah, so we are behind the scenes, but we are those people who make the money move. So the fact that you can now go to any ATM and use any car to withdraw cash or merchants don't have to have multiple point of sale terminals based on which card you bring, right. that's kind of the interoperability we enable behind the scenes. Also, when you get salary through all the EFTs and these monies, that's also something we move behind the scenes. Unfortunately, also the debit orders which come, mm -hmm. that's also mm -hmm. our doing. And uh, because we know how payments move, uh, some people may have heard about us also because we do these indices, how the economy is doing, what is the take home pay and right. stuff like that. I've so uh, those, yes. yeah, we do also, also that, but we are behind the scenes. So most people don't need to know about us if everything is working the way it's supposed to. But without banks of Africa, there is simply no economy. That is correct. Because you are the flow of money between financial institutions. We are, the, we are p that's kind of our saying we want to Power economy, improve lives, always. That's uh, that's what we do. Right, right. So who owns you? Are you owned by the banks? We are, uh, we are owned by banks. Um, so uh, we have four key shareholders, the largest uh, South African banks, but we also have uh, minority shareholders, uh, some of the smaller banks. But our governance is a little bit different. Uh, our board is half shareholding and half independent, and the chairperson is independent as well. So technically, we are driven by the public policy objectives and doing the right things for, for South Africa. You're a non-profit, I take it. We are not for profit maximization. So we generate profit because yeah. we need to reinvest into our technology and, um, and stuff. And you're quite, you, I mean, you're quite fundamental to the whole payment system, so you must be quite a, quite a, quite a tightly regulated institution as well. We are very regulated. We have a couple of regulators. Mm -hmm. Other people are interested in us. So yes, we have PASA, the Payment Association of South Africa, as one of our regulators. They are giving us a license. And then the South African Reserve Bank is also our regulator. And uh, FSCA, from a conduct perspective, they are not regulating us, but we are in, uh, we are in close, uh, close connection with them as well. Fascinating institution, and it's been around for a long time, 50 plus we years. We celebrated 50 in June, so this year. it was okay. five zero big celebration, and we have a nice little book showing how the world evolved from the magnetic tapes mm -hmm. being brought and the checks, the paper checks being brought to our offices. Now everything is electronic in small, small, and more and more small data centers, and now with the new platform, we will go completely to the cloud. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're many, get many in, changes. We're going to get into that in a moment. But yeah, the financial services industry has changed. Uh, I mean, just talking about check seems like such a dated concept now. But before the days, before the days of banks of Africa, how did one do a financial transaction from one bank to another? Well, no, like there was no interoperability, right? So uh, there were, don't forget, electronic payments were not so common. So it was really the checks, and mm. people were exchanging checks. So people were carrying bags from one one branch to another <laughs> and then you know that was the beginning of because we we are something called clearing house yeah. and as the couriers were kind of coming from one bank to another from one branch and another they realized it's probably better and more efficient to meet in one spot right so sometimes they did it in a pub which you know why not but uh, <laughs> you meet at a spot and you do this exchange clearing and you know mm -hmm. and then you go back to where you came from mm -hmm. so that's how clearing houses actually were created this mm -hmm. idea that you don't have to do everything bilaterally yep. you can do it more effectively by a center entity everybody trusts it's, it's fascinating stuff but so, something which i which really actually surprises me and i know i know south africa is largely a cash-based economy but the the numbers to me almost sound amazing that so many south africans a uh, nine in ten is it uh you still still transact with cash nine in ten Transactions, payments, payments, yeah. payments that happen in South Africa. Are so it's just under nine. So yes. So, yeah. uh, but um, Duncan, the thing is that many people pay 
quite often uh, yeah. for day-to-day -day necessities, mm -hmm. right? So uh, our research shows that an average South African uh, pays, and when I saw the number for the first time, I also couldn't believe it, around 1,500 times a year, which is like around five payments a day. Wow. So I don't know if I make five payments a day, but think about it, you know, taking taxis, buying your lunch, taking taxi home, and those are usually very, very small payments. Yes. Yes. So most of these cash payments are for very small amounts. And then the remaining 10% are all the di digital payments we are we are used to seeing. Right, and, and this, this program that you're working on, which we're gonna get into the, in this discussion, is, is hopefully gonna start to, to change that use of cash to make the economy more uh, digital. But this has been years in the coming. You've been working on some big projects to fundamentally overhaul the uh, back-end systems that you operate to prepare the country for, for rapid payments. Uh, mm -hmm. you've, you've, you're moving, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the discussion, to the cloud, but you've been, you've been doing a, a major upgrade of your underlying IT infrastructure. Maybe just take us through what you've been involved with in the last few years in terms of in terms of those upgrades and getting ready for this new payments environment. And some of the things you have already seen, right? Debit yeah. check, making sure that the debit orders, because there was this debit order abuse uh, when people yes. were taking money even without their authorization. So debit check was one of these modernization initiative on the on the debits. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one example. But uh, historically, we you know we are a platform which even today has to handle a lot of transactions. So in the first few months of a, a few days of a month, we have to maintain three, four, sometimes 500 transactions per second. Mm. So when you think about it, uh, those are withdrawals from ATMs. I have two, 300 people trying to draw money every second. You know, um, and, and they, so they don't want to wait more than They don't want to seconds. wait and they don't want to have the denial or something that something yeah. times out. So you need to keep up. So our SLAs have to continuously in, improve. So what we, we have been upgrading our infrastructure, going to you know, virtualized data centers so we can spin off uh, new servers relatively quickly if there is a demand for you know, higher, higher processing like during Black Friday or during uh, Christmas mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So we have been doing all of that, but it was more enhancements to the existing things we have. Now the new platform you mentioned, the rapid payments, it's a complete overhaul. It's, it's done in the cloud, it's done on APIs, uh, microservices architecture, so it's, it's very different. What is the microservices architecture? What does that mean exactly? It means that uh, in the past, uh, many things were kind of these monolithic things, mm -hmm. right? So if you wanted to change one little thing, it was months or sometimes years of a project because you changed it, but then you have to retest all of these things. Did you break something else while you were changing that thing? And that's not uh, how technology works these days. These days you try to break down a complex problem into very small pieces mm -hmm. which work together to actually solve the complex problem. So basically the functional architecture or the, the functionality of our solutions now, you have very small specialized pieces of uh, code and it talks to each other mm -hmm. through uh, through APIs and these components are called microservices. Right. So it's a much more modularized Absolutely. approach that allows you to... And you can quickly change. Change right? things, if I'm something, about to say. Yeah, yeah, if you want to change something. And I feel that uh, that's also with the rapid payments program. And by the way, the rapid payments program wasn't about rapid payments uh, when we started three years ago at the end of 2018 when I joined the company. It was about the rapid program because we learned that uh, technology is now different. It's like 3D printing. In mm. my mind, 3D printing changed manufacturing, right? You can now try things out relatively cheaply and quickly. Right. So that's what we did also with Rapid Payments Program. We started building these APIs, the microservices, we put it in the cloud and we invited uh, different players. Go try it out. It wasn't production ready, don't mm. get me wrong. Sure. It wasn't hardened or anything like that, but it created this excitement. Oh, we can do payments this way. It can be so much easier to connect. Should not It should not take six months. Mm -hmm. So we created excitement, which then helped with the momentum of the program overall. And, and I suppose uh, the, the pace of innovation in the financial services industry is so much faster today than it was just a few years ago. We've got yes. fintech players coming in, crypto is part of the ecosystem. There's a lot happening. You almost need a, a modular system like that where you can, where you can innovate uh, rapidly and introduce new ideas, see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, discard what, what doesn't work and, and integrate what does work very quickly into the national payment system. That's the difficult task. That's something called the future proofing, right? right? But you don't know what kind of future you are building for. Like uh, telephone. Telephone was invented by, uh, I don't know what, let's say Bell, uh, yeah. to listen to concerts remotely. 
Look at your smartphone today, it's quite different. So what I'm saying is we are putting kind of a physical infrastructure in place which has to cater for all kinds of use cases we currently don't have an idea. It's like when you build roads, right? You, you lay the asphalt down and you build roads. You want to cater for future electric cars, uh, buses and everything without necessarily changing mm. the infrastructure. You change the rules a little bit, you tweak it, but we need to build something which enables all kinds of use cases we mm. currently don't think, don't even think about. Right, right. So this this new platform, uh, the rapid payments program, is, is has been the, the term you've used to uh, up to now. But you've actually got a, a more consumer friendly name which you're going to market. Yeah, we now. we want to change how people perceive digital, right? Mm. And the fundamental, they are kind of the rapid payments program, actually has three objectives. Right. One is to come up with a product which we will launch to the market, like PayShop. That's, uh, that's how we're going to call it. PayShop. PayShop. And uh, it's going to support the new economy, the digital economy ideally, but the fast economy South Africans now have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And we want to create something people will feel comfortable to use rather than cash. Mm. And we can get into it because there are a lot of challenges to make something digital as attractive for people like transacting in cash. The second one is that it's a new way, as I mentioned, of running payments platforms or infrastructures, right? It's gonna be in the cloud. So we are also putting foundation for any kind of new services. Like the debit check may eventually migrate on the same mm. logic, microservices, API, right. EFT, all of that stuff. And the third thing which is probably equally important um, for us every time we want to introduce a new product or new idea, it's not just doing something within Bank South Africa. We need to get something we call a critical mass, mm -hmm. right? So get majority of the banks, majority of the fintechs to kind of like the idea and then move with us on this journey. And I mentioned this prototyping we started with, uh, you know, three years ago when we got people excited it allowed us to be quite fast in delivering a new product for industry like that. Because mm -hmm. when you look around the world, these things can take five, seven years sometimes. And we are third year, so not so bad. So those are the three things the rapid payments program is actually giving us. Let, let me pick up on that last point you raised. I presume all the banks have been working with you through this process. Uh, um, are, are, we, are we expecting all the big banks in South Africa and maybe some of the fintechs as well to, an, to announce and launch some exciting Products on the back of the rapid payments program, uh, in pretty sharp. pretty short order. Pay sharp, <laughs> pretty short, pretty sharply. <laughs> pretty sharply. That's that's the idea. Because yeah. unfortunately, when you, the one thing is to build the technology, which is not easy, but mm. it's also not the most complicated thing. The second part is to start convincing South Africans that digital payments can be cheap, they can be affordable, they can rely on them. And most importantly, and that's the most difficult part where we need the banks, we need fintechs and everybody to collaborate, mm. is you need to have some assurance that most of the places where you go, you're just carrying on with your life. Most people don't want to take a b t talk or think about payments, right? You want to buy your food, you want to buy a service. What is your guarantee that wherever you go, they will actually accept? a digital payment. So then you feel comfortable that you don't have to carry a lot of cash around and stuff like that. So we will have to educate and we will, you know, educate under this PayShop brand that, uh, you know, when you see the little logo somewhere or where you see the name, you know exactly what to expect. You mm -hmm. can scan a QR code or if you have a USSD uh, phone, feature phone, you just, you know, use a sequence of characters and stuff like that. So we will be doing an education. Uh, the problem would be if we have, let's say, only two banks participating. Mm. It's hard, right? Then you do education and you say, well, you can only pay to the other person if they bank with this bank or the other bank. So we need something we call critical mass. And we are now in market ac acceptance testing with mm. all the large banks. I hope they will be able to you know, meet the timeline. We want to go to market in March. So March we will be launching it. Uh, and we need to have as many players um, to, um, to address majority of South Africans. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I'm, um, I'm a, 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 an average South African who catches a taxi each day, goes to work, buys my lunch, the analogy we've been using in this discussion so far. What is my payments post the launch of PayShop? Um, and I, I want to move from cash to digital. What, what would my payments day look like? What would I be carrying in my pocket Absolutely. to make these payments? Um, how would it work? So I, I, I like that everybody starts with the taxi use case, which is probably the most difficult use case. <laughs> to. Have you been to the taxi? I have, right? It's it's very fast-paced environment. Mm. It has all its specific. So I know that there are some, you know, players being in banks or non-banks who are trying to solve for that. Uh, but 
taxis are difficult, <laughs> right? Because you have so many and people coming in and out. And stuff. Cash for that's exactly as well, that's right? exactly. You always have kind of tax optimization and <laughs> other things. Right. Um, but generally, the idea is that today, an average South African, when they receive money, being it a salary or being it a social grant or whatever it is, yeah. they go to an ATM and they withdraw it. So basically the bank accounts, even though as a country we have a very high penetration of bank accounts, yep. so the safe stores of value which are heavily regulated, but people don't use it as a transactional account. Why they is use that? it they use it as a mailbox. Uh, so we did also a bit of a research. It's a combination of factors, right? It's historical. When you have the when you have the banknotes, you know you get money, mm. right? It's not trusting something digital which you may feel, you know, it may go away one day. The other thing is people feel, and that's a real feel or fear, um, that um, if you receive a salary for this month, at the end of the month, it will disappear from the bank account. So there are some real concerns people are having fees as well, right? So, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm worried that if I leave the money there, the fees will slowly kind of eat away most of it. Mm. And that's a problem because once you get into the habit that you withdraw all your money in cash and then you transact in cash and you contribute to this almost nine out of 10 statistics, mm -hmm. um, you don't build your transaction history. Mm -hmm. You don't build your credit history. If you are a small business owner, nobody gives, gives you a credit to grow the business. And that's kind of the problem with financial inclusion. It's mm -hmm. not only about payments. It's these, it's these other services which you are not eligible for. So the idea here, and it will be a major lift, right? We need to show that PayShop is different, that it's not going to cost too much money, that people can trust it, that most places where they go, it would be accepted. The idea is that we would allow South Africans to leave money on the account where they received it. Mm -hmm. And they go then go to your taxi or do go to the, you know, to the informal merchant and just scan the QR code and say, okay, pay, yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not carry, not carry cash around because in yep. South Africa, it's still a risk to carry a lot of cash around you. So it's gonna have to be ultra convenient. It's gonna have to be very, very cheap. How very cheap, fast. Uh, how cheap? Um, so that's, that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> so this is something we need to leave to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is no price regulation. Some countries around the world, like India, they introduce a price regulation. So right. the government said, no, no, we will kind of limit the prices for transaction below cent certain threshold. Right. And I think they even compensated, um, you know, the merchants and the banks uh, for, for that. I don't think that's something which will be happening in South Africa. We will leave it to the market. What we need to do in the center you know, behind the scenes, yeah. we cannot charge much. Um, so we are thinking or we are talking about few cents per transaction. Mm -hmm. There is also something called interchange, which is a big thing in payments. And that means, you know, how the parties who are all playing in exchanging the payment, they share some of the revenue. And in some cases like card payments, unfortunately, these interchange contribute to higher cost mm -hmm. of, a, of an acceptance of a card payment. Mm -hmm. The South African Reserve Bank sets the interchange in this country, and they uh, actually set the interchange for PayShop uh, very, very low. So mm -hmm. they are really indicating that we expect the market to be, to be as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a competition between the banks and everyone else to make sure that if you are enabling somebody to pay 10 rand digitally, mm. you cannot charge 8 rand for it, mm -hmm. right? Especially mm -hmm. if the center cost yeah. 15 cents, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's what we have built. And I think most of uh, most of the participants in this on this journey with us, they understand that it's not really about, uh, you know, capturing the 10% of digital payments we have and, you know, allowing people rather than using a card to use a QR code. No, it's really about the 90% of other transactions which we want to bring into the more formal mm. digital space. I've been amazed, uh, uh, just before COVID hit back in March 2020, South Africans were very reluctant to use tap to pay at That's point true. of sale. As soon as COVID happened, I noticed that tap to pay exploded. Took off, it, like now everybody uses it. Tap your card, tap your phone, tap your watch. Uh, it's it's now accepted as a safe means of of, of payment. Um, is 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 the sort of tap to pay infrastructure where you see this rapid payments infrastructure going as well? When you get on the taxi, you <coughs> simply tap your smartphone and you've paid to for your ride. Um, or is it going to? Are we going to see other types of? Um, uh, uh, interactions at the point of sale. I think we will see, and that's kind of you know preparing for the future and thinking about the art of possible. Mm. So the tapping, it's still usually riding the card yes, kind yes. of payment yes. solution underneath. 
with all its you know fees and, and stuff like that. Mm. You don't necessarily need to be tapping, right? There are other ways how you create this interaction. One is, as I mentioned many times, you can scan a QR code, yeah. right? So you can be further away. There are all kinds of uh, all kinds of benefits of QR code. You can carry more information sometimes. But there are other things, right? We how we are setting up this um, this PayShop solution is that you will be able to just you know, tell people, for example, your cell phone number. Mm -hmm. And it will be linked to your bank account or multiple bank accounts if you want. Right. So then when somebody wants to request money from you, you can just tell them your cell phone number. And they just key it in, boop, press enter, and then key your participant... On, on the internet or uh, where? Well, on their Anywhere. solution, acceptance okay. solution, exactly. And uh, then it talks to our PayShop solution right. and your bank which participates there, we ping because we say, hey, this number seems to be registered with this Duncan's bank. So we pass it over and your bank is obliged to pop up a channel, being it a USSD code to you mm. or just an app code and say, Duncan, somebody wants you to pay 300 rand for something. Mm. And you just say yes or no. Okay. So there are very different ways of the interaction, but yeah. uh, exactly what you are saying, we, we are trying to get away from uh, kind of the established ways that either you have to tap or you have to tell somebody your mm. account number and branch code and uh, name of your grandmother and many other sure. information, which is not convenient, right? But Banks of Africa is going to leave that to the market to decide. You want the market to innovate. You're not going to say, this is how you're going to do this. So what we did, uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, the, what's important for us is that we call the PayShop a scheme or something uh, which should bring consistency of experience. Mm -hmm. And especially if you are trying to educate country and citizens here that, uh, hey, this is going to be awesome for you to use. It brings a lot of benefits. The experience has to be kind of similar, regardless if you bank with FNB or if you bank with Standard Bank or any other bank. You need to know what to expect. And that's what we did in kind of minimum requirements. So we say, you know, for example, it should take you know, these few steps to initiate a payment. Mm -hmm. Or when, you, when your bank receives a request to pay for you, they need to publish it to you in a real time. Or another example is that we said uh, once you receive money through PayShop, your bank has to make it available on your bank account within a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to use it right away. Mm -hmm. So we set kind of these minimum requirements but we don't want to you know, stop innovation. So I believe that many people will come up with even more innovative way how to capture yeah. customers, the new markets and stuff like that. Is this gonna change the traditional, um, uh, sort of, okay, if I can call them legacy banking processes? For example, I want to transfer money from my bank account to your bank account online. It currently takes 24 hours or longer. It's a weekend for that money to go through. Is that going to change as well as we move to the rapid payments? That's period? the idea of rapid or real-time so payments or payshop. So it's uh, really the way how mm -hmm. you move money. Mm -hmm. One thing, Duncan, is uh, because it changes quite fundamentally and challenges many people in the value chain of a payment. Yeah. So our platform has to be always on 24 times 7, handle a lot of transactions. Imagine, I mentioned 300 really TPS. Does. Well, but imagine that we have to eventually serve nine times that. That's mm -hmm. not just a doubling, right? It's mm -hmm. 10 times, almost 10 times, 10 fold more. Yeah. So uh, it will challenge many things. The other aspect is I mentioned to you that the money will be irrevocable. So what I mean by that is when you decide to send me money, in 10 seconds, it either succeeds or fail. Mm -hmm. So you know if the money went or not. Not like these days that sometimes it can be pending mm -hmm. and you don't know. So it will either succeed or fail. But when it succeeded, I can go and take the money and spend it right away. So each bank on both sides mm -hmm. or each participant on both sides, they have to make decision. Is this a genuine transaction? Mm -hmm. Is it a fraudulent transaction? So building new risk management, fraud management engines in the center. So that's one thing we are doing, building a better fraud and risk management. But each bank will have much shorter time to decide if it's a fair transaction. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what I'm saying about that is that we are starting with a relatively low value limit. So you will be able to send money up to, let's say, I think we are starting with 3,000 rand. Okay. So that's what you start with because we want to manage the risk, mm -hmm. you know, for everyone. But just one statistics I want to give you, you talk about this EFT, how you send money and yeah. it takes, uh, actually more than half of payments going through EFT are below 3,000 today. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's, it's actually a large, large volume even yeah. in the existing environment. Yeah. So we expect that some of the volumes may migrate but one other thing is also, Duncan, don't forget that many of these 
traditional processes, not every single payment has to be real time. Because mm-hmm. it costs, it comes at a cost, right? Sure. You need to have liquidity and all of that stuff. So if you pay salaries, you probably know a few days in advance how much you will be paying mm-hmm. your people. Mm-hmm. And you have an ERP system, which is kind of more batch driven. Mm-hmm. So I believe, and that's what we have seen around the world, some of this batch or you know, longer lasting payments will still still stay around for some use cases. For some time, okay. Um, so 3,000 rand limit, will that just be during a, a pilot rollout of the system? We'll see, like we don't have a limit technically mm-hmm. on the platform. We, the only limit is that us as Bank Surf Africa, we can process uh, below 5 million. So uh, everything above 5 million has to go to the high value system, which is uh, which is uh, run by the central bank. Mm-hmm. So anything you know below 5 million is our space. So you know that there is quite a distance between 3,000 and 5 million. Yes. Usually again, we are not the first country introducing something like PayShop. Mm. Uh, so you saw a progressive increase. Um, so I, I don't have a timeline. We really will see and learn. And we expect that most of the nine out of 10 payments are actually below the 3000 limit. So it should not be as constraining at the beginning. Is there a particular market that uh, South Africa is modeling this off? Have you looked at particular examples around the world and said, this is well suited to South Africa, let's do what these guys are doing? So uh, yes, we did, but it was more an inspiration rather than copying because the sure. one thing, uh, one thing, you know, something which worked in another jurisdiction or another country doesn't always work in quite similar markets either. Like M-Pesa, I, I think you know about M-Pesa and Kenya, you know, super successful. In South Africa, it has been attempted a few times and for all kinds of reasons, it never succeeded. Mm-hmm. But having said that, when we started the journey, we actually took quite a few people on a journey to Southeast Asia. And sometimes, you know, uh, I came from Canada. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Western world, people feel like they do everything really well, right? US or Canada or Europe. When it comes to payments, they are not bad, but they are behind compared to South. uh, The US was using checks until not long ago. (laughs) Yeah, Canada is still using checks. The only thing is like you take a picture of it when you receive it and then you submit it digitally to your (laughs) bank to deposit. Well, but anyway, so not, not going to Canada or US for inspiration. Um, but we went to Southeast Asia mm-hmm. um, and uh, Southeast Asia, India, Thailand, uh, even Singapore, we've learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so the platform we are putting in place, it has some inspiration from the unified payment interface in India. Mm-hmm. And India is now, uh, well, China is probably still larger, but it's hard to get real data from China. But sure. uh, based on the data available, India is one of the one of the markets with the highest mobile payment, mobile real-time payment penetration in the world. Okay. Now, I want to ask about social media because there's some really interesting stuff, particularly on instant messaging. Um, I know that um, Meta Platforms, as they're now called, what used to be called Facebook, Facebook yeah. um, has r- is starting to experiment with payments in WhatsApp in some markets. I think it's in Brazil and India, India and possibly one or two others. Uh, they're probably going to look at African markets, possibly South Africa at some point. You may have even had conversations with them. I don't know. Um, Will this platform, PayShop, facilitate uh, those social media giants and ch- yeah. from coming into this market and offering those solutions? So one thing, uh, so the, the short answer is that the platform is, again, flexible to cater for almost any use case, okay. right? Because it's taking instruction to move money from one place to another. One limitation currently in South Africa is the regulation. Mm-hmm. You know, who can, uh, who can basically instruct someone to move money, who can hold deposits? So uh, we got indications from the South Africa Reserve Bank that they have, a, they have an intent to open access and allow some of the non-traditional or less traditional players to play in the, in the, in the payments uh, landscape. What, uh, what we are building, and that's what I, you know, we never know what's going to happen in the future, but my prediction is, and that's what you saw also in India, is that these giants or these uh, technology companies, they don't always want to be bothered to hold deposits because it comes with a lot of burden, Mm -hmm. you know, regulatory burden, Mm -hmm. because once you hold someone's money, you have to be heavily regulated, right? What they want to, though, is to create channels where when people want to buy something on Facebook Marketplace or you are chatting on WhatsApp that you want to buy, want to buy something, you want to be able to initiate payment. Mm -hmm. So what Facebook or Meta Uh, is now looking for is more, can I actually reach the bank accounts of my customers and initiate a payment? And that's what I kind of see that there will be multiple channels Mm -hmm. how a payment can be initiated. But at the end of the day, if you bank with bank A, Facebook will just instruct through PayShop 
through a request to pay, potentially. Hey, Duncan, now you are on WhatsApp. You just said that you want to pay 100 rand to someone. Your, your bank just pops up the app over it and says, hey, there is this 100 rand request. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we want to enable these channels to actually start transacting with the secure traditional banking world because many of South Africans, they have a bank account and they get money there. Right? Yeah, so. yeah. And it raises an interesting question about micropayments on the internet as well, which has been a, a, a bugbear, I suppose, for publishers and, and uh, content creators online for, for many pay years. Pay for an article. Pay for one episode of this wonderful show, right? Does that, that facilitate that you could do this with, with PayShop? That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So, again, it depends how much you value your show, right? If you charge 100 rand, it's probably easier because even if there is a one rand fee, for example, to pay for it, people will be willing. If you want to charge a real micropayment like 5 rand, we just need to make sure that when it gets to the market, people will price it appropriately. Well, next time we do an interview with, with you, we'll, uh, we'll charge for access using micro, <laughs> micro payments. I hope patient. so. I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely try that. So fascinating stuff. It's launching in March next year. Payment limit initially of 3,000 Rand. Look forward to, to, to trying it out and seeing the impact it has on the market. But before I let you go, uh, Jan, there's some other projects which Banks of Africa has been working on, which I also want to explore just briefly. Um, I, I believe there's a, a platform called Request to Pay that's in development. This is a kind of a second phase of the rollout of, PayShop, of, yeah. of yep. PayShop. What is Request to Pay? When is it coming? What is it going to do? So I already mentioned uh, to you, so PayShop uh, kind of, PayShop in March will enable two things, right? Yep. You will go and you will register through your, we call it a store of value owner, but basically your bank, let's say, mm -hmm. if you have a bank account, and you will say, hey, I want this bank account to be linked to this cell phone number, yeah. which I have. Yeah. And then when I want to send you money, I can just say, I am sending to this cell phone number. And I don't even have to know who you are, technically. But what it does, the platform, it says it kind of does the you know, validation. We realize that this cell phone is registered. And then it comes back with Duncan and your last name, but with some asterisks, so we kind of are you know, Papaya compliant. Mm -hmm. And then I say, I pay. And in less than 10 seconds, you have the money, you can use it, which is very powerful because you can use it in merchants, you can use it anywhere. Mm. And you don't have to tell me the, the cell phone number, you can show me a QR code and I just scan right. it and it happens, okay. right? If we are close. So that's first. Then second one is this request to pay, which will be the next feature rolling out. I still hope it's going to roll out next year uh, because, you know, the functionality is kind of developed already. Not in March, later next later year. Later next mm -hmm. year, yeah. Um, and that's, uh, it has many use cases. One is... The obvious one, we go for dinner, and next day, because I paid, next day, hey, Duncan owes me half of, the, half of the dinner. So I send you a request to pay, and I say, hey, Duncan, you owe me 200 rand for half of the dinner. And it reminds you, because immediately, you know, the bank pops up and say, yes, no. Hopefully you say yes, and the money again in a few seconds come back. Mm -hmm. But I already mentioned the example that you are somewhere, you know, in a channel, like being a taxi or being at a WhatsApp or something, and you want to pay someone, you can use the request to pay. So there are very creative ways because you can just key in your cell phone number. Mm. And the, you know, somebody who wants your money, they will just come to the platform and they will say, okay, is this registered? You say, yeah, we wrote it. And it again pops up on your screen and you say yes. So there are many, many use cases of the request to pay. And I think that's one of the features which will be used by all kinds of players for all kinds of creating things. Something that just came to mind in South Africa, which is a very data poor country. People, a lot of people have smartphones, but a lot of people don't have access to data all the time. Will you need data to do all of these things? Well, that's a good question. So, of course, if you are using a smart app, uh, you know, smartphone app th that requires data, I, I have to understand exactly how the USSD codes are happening. If, uh, if it really charges you data, it depends which USSD code. And mm -hmm. that's going to be, again, left to the market. I know that even today, if I understand correctly, some banks, they, when you do s use um, the app, it's zero it's rated. It's zero so rated. So we basically the same thing, zero rating. Yeah, so I think the banks will mm -hmm. come up with some, uh, some ideas how to make it possible. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you, uh, you're working on uh, something which sounds very fascinating. We, last time we spoke, we, we chatted about it uh, briefly, but uh, and we won't go into detail here because I know it's a, a, a quite a complex platform. Next step It's going to have a, a, a big impact as well, potentially down the line, and that's Banks of Africa's Digital Identity Project. What is that and when is it coming and what is it going to do? So, yeah, so sometimes I feel we are an ambitious organization and we take, uh, <laughs> <You are>. big, <laughs> we take big challenges. So, like changing, you know, how people pay in a country, it's one challenge. And when you start, the odds are against you. Uh, you mentioned Banks of Africa. Mm -hmm. Usually these programs, by the way, 
they are not ours, right? Because we need to do it with the community. Uh, right. You know, so we drive it, we come up with ideas, but it's really with broader communities. Of course. So the digital identity is another similar example, right? Because as South Africans, I think we should be proud of what we have, right? The, the Department of Home Affairs, the database they have for pretty much all citizens where we can validate if you are who you are based on your ID number. We can even get some of biometric information about you. Mm -hmm. That's great, right? That's a very good foundational piece. Us, I mentioned before that we are all about interoperability. Mm -hmm. I mentioned, you know, that the ATMs talking to each other, point of sale talking to each other. We are applying similar principle because when it comes to digital identity, it's more than just validating that you are a citizen that, or that you exist. Yeah. We may want to have your credentials about your education. We may want to have your vaccination credentials right, or whatever. And what you see in the market is that these different solutions are popping up and mushrooming around. What we are driving with this uh, initiative is, call it a scheme or kind of an interoperability platform that we, ad we create rules and some technical infrastructure that people will be able to trust each other. So if there is a provider which is providing uh, you know, academic credentials, then there is a home affairs which is providing the database of citizens, and there is somebody else who is providing uh, vaccination mm -hmm. in a self-sovereign way, so you are in control of a all your information, we will make it all talk to each other and trust each other and kind of adhere to minimum standards. So it's in very early days. We have a prototype again because I told you that we are doing things differently now. So we, we started with a sandbox with prototype and the community is larger than just banks. Mm -hmm. We have telcos involved, we have insurance companies, we have government involved. So it's in early days, but it will help with the vision of digital economy we mm. see and more verifiable claims. Right. It sounds like something that uh, the blockchain was made for. Are you building this on the blockchain? Uh, currently we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it may be a bit of a hybrid. Uh, so okay. even the PayShop, by the way, the proxy component, yeah. so where you register your cell phone to your, it's actually a distributed ledger technology as oh, well. So we are combining different, uh, different technologies where we see a fit. Do you see through all of the, the, the innovation that you're doing here that you're going to introduce crypto payments into the ecosystem at some point? Well, that's one thing uh, the South African Reserve Bank is actually experimenting it with is. the mm. central bank digital currency. So they, will, they may be publishing something soon. I have been involved in other initiatives around the world. Mm. For us, uh, Duncan, as a central bank, uh, sorry, as a clearinghouse, we need to understand that we will need to be able to clear and settle whatever value people are willing to hold. So today, if it's digital rent, we do it. Tomorrow, if people want to trade you know, crypto tokens, mm -hmm. we need to find a way how to, how to clear them and settle. And of course, you know, if somebody, if entire economy moves to Bitcoin, unlikely it hasn't happened over the last 14 years, so it's unlikely, uh, that's fine. They don't need us for it. Yeah. But once in a while, you need to go from and uh, in to the ecosystem. So yes. you need to make payment from your Bitcoin wallet to your Ethereum wallet or to your RAND bank account. And that's where I see the evolving role of clearing houses. We will need to able to we will need to be able to facilitate all of these. Mm. Jan Pilbauer, CEO of BankServe Africa. Thanks so much for making the time. It's obviously a fascinating uh, time to be in financial services, not just in South Africa but worldwide. But some uh, incredible stuff happening. The March 2023 launch of PayShop, uh, I think, is the one to watch. Uh, and uh, hopefully, it's going to lead to a lot of innovation in the fintech space in this market going forward. You will experience payments differently starting next year. Thank you so much for being. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you, Duncan.